Hello everyone, my name is Cristofo De Martino and today it's my pleasure to give a uh, the speech at the second international conference on construction materials and structures. Um, the title of my presentation will be Green Cement Based Materials Under High Strain Rates. Um, I would like to discuss you because I spent the last five years discussing about this and it's a good opportunity to share with you the last improvements in our research area. Uh, this is my email if you want to write me after the lecture to ask me or I hope at the end of this lecture, since this is recorded, but we will have a question and answer session, we can discuss a little bit about the uh, things I, I'm reporting in this presentation. This is the outline of my presentation. Uh, before uh, I will give some introduction and motivation of the research I carried out, and I will try to share with you my opinion why it's important to study this. I will introduce the concept of rapidly varying loads because it's quite important to understand that the mechanic behavior of concrete in this case is um, different when you are um, applying the load in a fast way. I will present the king of the apparatus for investigating the material behavior and the high strain rates of if you want under when the load is changing very fast, that is the split up in some pressure bar or is well known as with this acronym SHPB. Uh, I will discuss about the behavior of traditional concrete, let's say, and then I will give you some three examples here. You can see of materials, green materials, or if you want materials adopting uh, recycled components uh, that are the concrete with substitute coarse aggregates. And I will introduce you the concept of recycled crushed concrete and clay bricks, the fiber reinforced rubberized concrete, and also the concrete with two different types of substitute plastic. And finally, I will give some conclusion and perspectives. So uh, before to start, it's good to give a small reminder of what is concrete, maybe given the um, quality of this, the audience of the quality, the technical quality of the audience of this conference, and especially in the area of material and concrete is useless, but I think it's good to give a short uh, recap. Concrete is made of, uh, you can see four uh, main parts, the water, fine aggregate, coarse aggregate, and the cement. And uh, you can see this part are combined together to provide a liquid material or a fluid material that after um, a certain carrying time becomes strong. And you can see also here a kind of overview of the typical uh, amount of each part in terms of percentage of volume. So why concrete is so special? Um, concrete is special because as I told you before, the uh, concrete can be first liquid, and after a while, you know, if you wait a little bit, then it becomes stronger. And uh, since it's liquid at the beginning, is a fluid, we can give to the concrete whatever shape. You can see an example, this is in Italy, is uh, mm, the uh, so-called Musmech bridge. In, uh, it's a fantastic double curved shell structure. You can see realized by reinforced concrete material. And you can see that you can give this shape. But why concrete is so, so nice? Because many materials are like this, you know, I'm showing you that also the bottom part of the slide, you can see here that also the, um, the you can see the uh, steel can be liquid, but the difference is that concrete can be liquid at a normal temperature, so you can touch it. So uh, there is a big, uh, the, the, the good things uh, is what I told you, but on the other end, uh, I'm sure that you know that concrete is the second material adopted after water by humans. Uh, the problem is that, you know, uh, concrete, you know, is uh, um, highly, is characterized by a very bad uh, environmental impact. The reason for that is that you can see here, this is the typical, you know, phases of the manufacturing of concrete, starting from the uh, material, you can see here, uh, the cement and the aggregate, and each of these steps reported in this slide, you know, are producing a lot of carbon or dioxide, so which is generally an indicator, you know, of the environmental impact in terms also of uh, global warming and so on. So if we can reduce the use of the materials, in particular recycled aggregate, or we can reduce the use of cement, we can reduce in some sense the uh, impact of the concrete. According to this, I mean, several researchers try to think about the um, life cycle uh, of the of a concrete structure, starting from the material um, finding, you know, or use, and also the energy you need to put, because we say that before that cement is magic, right? Is before is a powder, then you mix with water, and then you obtain something strong. 
But on the other end, when you manufacture it, you have to put a lot of water to uh, produce the what is called the uh, clinker, right? So um, this is quite important. And we have also to keep in mind that if we can change some part of the concrete, I, I've shown you before in some slides before that what are the typical elements, we can reduce the environmental impact of the concrete. So uh, generally speaking, the, all the strategies in this direction are called uh, strategies to produce a green concrete. And you can read here a definition that green concrete is the concrete that uses waste material as at least one of its component or its production process does not lead to environmental destruction. So uh, in this sense, I start to study recently the adoption of this green concrete. And we also put a lot of attention, you can see, in the case of high uh, strain uh, conditions. So this means you can see here that there are many cases like this low probability impact. You can see this is in the north of Italy. Is a track containing fuel impacting another track containing paper. Unfortunately, you will see that after a while, you can see that uh, track containing inside this tank, uh, the fuel, you can see, exploded. Certainly, uh, all these conditions cannot be modeled as in the typical static conditions, and we will see in a while that this is also inducing a variation of the material behavior. You can see here that um, what happened, you know, is uh, uh, it was in 2018, you can see the highway exploded, and you can see, thanks to, I mean, the efficient behavior of the local government, you can see after a few months, you know, they repaired it. But it's obvious that the response of the material under such crazy fast explosion it's different from is different from the static condition and uh, regarding for instance the impact okay the collision of vehicle against structural elements it's interesting to say that these are more frequent than we can expect you know um, so you can see here that for instance this is a typical statistics from the united states provided from this study here you can see that the collision reach the collision producing 12% around 12% of the case of failure of bridges and it's interesting also to compare with earthquakes right where we have uh, no more than 4% so the difference is certainly uh, due to the fact that the earthquake is producing uh, time and spatial uh, correlation of the damage. So this means that when you have an earthquake, you know, you have all the damage in the same location around the um, location where the earthquake hit the area. While you can see the collision, you know, is totally random in space and time. But in any case, in total of total, in total number, you can see that after, you know, the hydraulic causes that are quite important, you know, is the second problem for bridges. And you can see also there are many statistics. This is a statistics for the United States published recently in this report by Professor Lagraval. You can see showing that some countries, you know, are experiencing much more problem of bridge eating. And uh, this is something, you know, we have to study and we have to produce research in order to understand this. So why uh, I'm combining these two topics today? Because uh, the idea is that we can understand better how to use green material inside the impact. Certainly the impacts, you know, green material research is not my uh, my idea, you know, it's an old idea, you know, it's full of research and I'm sure also today in the audience is full of people. But the idea is that we can combine, you know, the good performance of recycled material or green concretes for impact. As we said before, we have to study in a different way, you know, the behavior or under impacts or under explosion because we, the characteristic is that everything is very fast, you can see here. There, is, there are high peak values of the forces. The inertial effects due to the accelerations can be not negligible. And we have, today we will discuss in particular about this, strain rate effects. Or if you want, in other words, we have a variation of the mechanical behavior of the material scale due to the fact that we are applying the load fast. And you can see also, this is a comparison, you know, between a quasi-static load here and a, start, a very fast load, you know, we have the propagation of a wave inside the body. So why I'm saying that there is a big opportunity I can see recently in thinking about green materials together with uh, uh, under impact or rapid load, because generally the problem of green materials is that their mechanical performance are slightly lower than the traditional materials. That's not obvious, always true, obviously, but in the majority of the case, the um, advantage that you are obtaining in terms of environmental impact is... Uh, going in the opposite direction in terms of the um, the, embryo, the the mechanical performance. So in this way, I think there is a huge need, for instance, under impact to protect you know, our structure from impacts. 
And when you have an impact or you have an explosion, certainly you cannot think to work for in terms of strength. But we have to try to obtain a um, dissipation, a dissipation of the energy. So in this case, you can see this protective barrier. For instance, the idea is that this is uh, something we published recently, but using uh, FR CFRP to protect a bridge pier. But the idea is that we can use this material that, although characterized by reduced mechanical performance, that can be used in dissipating the energy in case of impacts or blast or whatever is applying these crazy fast loads. And here you can see also our research. I mean, and this is what we are working in this, um, in the next, we will work in the next year. You can see here the idea to use these uh, green materials for our protection. And you can see also this paper uh, published on IC structure that gave us basically the cover of, of this journal. But you can see that the idea is that we can use the, these materials. Generally speaking, and then I will go back to the main topic of this presentation today. I'm working, you know, to develop, you know, a uh, general framework, you know, where we can consider, you can see a multi-hazard environment, uh, vehicular impact and, for instance, also explosion in a road network level to provide a unified firm framework for design, assessment, monitoring and retrofit. And you can see here, improve the resilience life protection, reducing the environmental impact and increase the robustness of the structure. So um, in this uh, the lecture today, I will try my best to explain you how to combine, you can see this concept of green material and uh, the uh, uh, resistance under high rapid load. At this stage of the research, we are working certainly at material level. I hope that maybe next year, you know, I can come with results at the structural level. Before to continue, I would like to share with you an important concept. What is the difference between a fast load and slow load, right? Because today I told you, uh, yeah, we are working with fast load. We are thinking that these uh, green materials characterized by a uh, slightly less mechanical performance can be useful in dissipating the energy. So what is the difference between fast and slow? You can see here a rabbit and a turtle, right? The rabbit generally is fast, you know, a rat turtle is not so fast. So let's take an, as an example, okay, a uh, force where this force is changing with the time linearly. You know, we are applying this force very slow. You can see here that if we take the typical differential equation of a dynamic system where we have that first term representing the inertial terms, the second term representing the damping, and finally the restoring force, if we apply the force very slow, you can see the increase of the force is very slow. Basically, the acceleration and the velocities are negligible. And so we have the typical static example. Let's increase a little bit the speed of variation of the load. For instance, you can see here, we apply a sinusoidal load and we know very well that we have a, a much more complex you know, response of the system and that can be defined, you can see, through this typical response function where you have the response function, you know, is a function of the frequency ratio, which is the ratio of the force applied to the, to the, applied to the force with respect to the natural frequency of the system. And this, especially in the resonant part, or if you want, when the frequency of the force applied and the natural frequency of the system are similar is strongly dependent on the structural damping of the system. But this is something that we know very well. But in many cases, like the two uh, cases we have seen uh, on the right left part in the introduction and motivation of this presentation, on the left part, uh, you can see now is an explosion due to a similar problem. We can imagine that the loads applied are much, much more faster than the typical one we are studying in structural engineering. And this condition, you can see, can be quite common. For instance, you can see a truck hitting a, a bridge pier system, or you can see here that uh, we have the collision. This is the accident, the, the, accident, the terrorist accident, the, the, the accident induced by the terrorist on the, the Twin Towers in 2001. So in this case, uh, the situation is a little bit different because we have a force you can see applied in our system. Uh, I'm representing it, maybe I didn't say before, as a cantilever column, but that's not so relevant. And you can see that when you apply the forces so fast, you can see, imagine this time is very small. We don't have any effect of the damping, certainly, because the, um, the velocity are very, very small. But you can see we are producing very large acceleration. So we have high inertial forces. This is what I said during the introduction and we have you can see a response that is you can see now there is a question mark but we will understand is a little bit different because the material properties are different compared to when i'm applying the force in a uh, in a not so fast way so in this case we can define something similar to the response um, uh, 
spectrum of the uh, what we have seen before under sinusoidal load, we can define something that is defined as shock response spectrum. And you can see here that we have a force, for instance, changing for a very short time, here defined as t theta. And you can see here that we can define a response spectrum in a non-dimensional way, similar to before. And in this part, you can see that we have a response spectrum uh, also modeled for different typical shape you can see here of the load. So um, also in this sense, you know, there is a big difference in terms of the load when it's applied locally or when it's applied distributely. This is the typical case of an impact and this is the typical case of a blast at a certain distance. But you can see when the load is applied locally, you know, we can activate some local mechanism compared to not, nor, not normally activated, in particular the shear, because it's a kind of punching. And you can see that we can totally change the response. What is the problem in this story? The problem in this story is that the material response or the material mechanical behavior is different from the, uh, the material behavior we are observing under quasi-static or if you want, lower line loads. To understand this concept, I think uh, I like always to give this example of the nail. Uh, you can see, imagine to have a nail, a hammer. We are applying, okay, uh, eating by eating the nail. You can see we are applying a tension load to the nail. Um, I'm saying tension to don't consider any instability at this stage. And uh, if we apply the nail and, you know, we apply the, low, the load very, very slowly, you know, we are observing the typical response, okay, of steel. You know, the typical response of the steel is an elastic stage, then we have the yielding point, and then, you know, we have an hardening and softening point until we reach the fracture. This is true, but what is surprising is that if we start to eat faster and faster with the nail, you know, on with the hammer, or sorry, on the nail, we will observe, you know, an increase, uh, and for steel, this is not so strong, as you can see here in this figure taken from the paper reported below, you can see that when we are increasing the speed, imagine this number that we will understand in a while what is this, it's called strain rate. We are increasing the, uh, the, the, the velocity where we are applying the load. You can see that the stress is increasing, the strength is increasing, and this is called a strain rate effect. And is very, very common in many materials, and we will see in a while, it's quite common in uh, concrete, for concrete material, and it's very, very important and relevant. So uh, to understand, let's recap some concept. Uh, when we have a, a member, okay, in this case, the nail under tension, we can define a stress, which is the force divided by the area. And we can define a deformation, you know, uh, first in terms of uh, um, cinematic of the system. So the strain can be defined as the variation of the length divided by the initial length. And you can see, we can generally define a constitutive law to join these two quantities. And in the case of an elastic material, we can define the elastic modulus. When we are applying the load very fast, we can introduce, and that's the number we have seen just before in the slides, this strain rate, you can see. The strain rate is the derivative of the strain, so is the derivative of the, the, formation, the strain with respect to the time. If we do the derivation, we will discover that this number is the velocity of the formation divided by the initial length. For example, okay, to give you an idea, if we have a 10 millimeter long specimen deformed from one, one to 100 meter per second, you know, we have a strain rate from 10 to two to 10 to four seconds to minus one. Uh, remember that the units is second to minus one of the strain rate. So generally we are using this strain rate as measure of how fast we are applying the load. And now you can understand that in this case, what we have to do is to define a different constitutive load Traditional constitutive laws are only depending on the deformation. When you want to consider this, you have to have a, a constitutive law also depending on the strain rate or this number here. And if you follow the color of the lines, you will clearly see that these lines are increasing when the strain rate is increasing, or if you want, in other words, if the speed of the law is increasing. And uh, generally speaking, for a professional application, or if you want from a simplification in the tradition, in the practice, we are defining another important quantity that is called the dynamic increase factor. That is a dimensionless number, you can see, showing the ratio of a certain quantity measured under dynamic condition or at a certain strain rate, or if you, uh, uh, made, made non-dimensional with respect to the same quantity uh, calculated for a static condition, quasi-static condition, or if you want, slow uh, conditions. This is very important because basically what you can do is to obtain here you can see a dynamic um, characteristic 
for a certain strain rate by multiplying this coefficient by the static one. And this ratio, you can see, is basically, for instance, in the stress strain uh, curve, you know, is the stress, you know, evaluated on the dynamic condition or the static condition or that should be clear, so clearly defined. So we have several equipments to measure the, um, the conditions under high strain rate. So you can see this summary, okay, of the strain rate with the difference level of load and also with the different equipment. And I will try to give you an overview and explain you why we have to use special equipment under such conditions. Let's start in this case from the universal testing machine. Okay, we know very well. I'm sure all of us, we used, uh, at least also when we were students, you know, uh, the universal testing machine, the principle is quite simple. You take a specimen, you put the specimen between two plates, you apply a force on the two plates, and after that, you know, you will see that um, the force is increasing and we can calculate the deformation, the stress and deformation of the material. We uh, testing a lot concrete, and that's the way we are also providing a, a exact quantification of the strength of the material, which is the probably the most important variable we are using in the structural design. We can test the specimens of different time, you know, and we know now very well the relationship between the, you can see an example here of a correction factor between the different variables. And the principle is quite easy. So you can see, we can measure the displacement, for instance, on a cylinder and the force applied here. And uh, if we want really to have an accurate curve, you know, never use the plate displacements. That's a suggestion as an experimentalist. Try to use strain gauge, but they are working very well below before the cracking. Or try to use uh, extensometer that are working much better and are giving you a general globalized overview. And, you know, this is a practice uh, very common. Uh, and you can find several standards of code. For instance, this is the British standard, okay? But each country, I mean, I'm sure, as a is on uh, standard and there is nothing to comment about this what is the problem is that in this test okay yeah certainly we can test faster okay if we use for instance this machine i downloaded uh, some uh, traditional uh, um, electromechanical machine we can read that the maximum plate velocity is around 16 millimeter per second so let's assume we have a typical specimen of a height of 300 millimeters so this means that for the left case or if you want for a normal um, electromechanical okay machine we can test up to 005 seconds to minus one if you buy this crazy state of the art you know uh, machine you know is a nice trade vhs system you know from uh, a company i think is instrument but by the way all the companies are producing similar uh, machines but you can see this is very fast this one can reach a velocity of the plate of twenty five thousand millimeter per second yeah, in this case, we can reach 80, 80 seconds to minus one, but certainly is a state-of-the-art machine, crazy expensive. I never seen, honestly, in person uh, this equipment. And, you know, is also producing complex condition to be controlled. But you can see also the oil system here to reach such velocity is very high. Now we can go back and you can understand why it's not good to be there, because uh, uh, for the first case, uh, if my memory is right, we were around uh, 005, you know, so this means we are... Uh, we are around the less than earthquakes, you know, so we cannot cover all the earthquakes. But you can see, generally, for blast and explosion, that are the most important things to be studied in this case, we need to reach 10 to 100 or 1,000 at least to understand the full behavior. But in any case, this is, yeah, is right. We can test a little bit better, but in any case, it's a very, very expensive equipment, a state of the art and not common. So another solution is to use the drop hammer, okay? The idea of the drop hammer, okay, is to, to release a mass, you can see here. This is a test performed on a beam uh, uh, in, uh, at Nanjing Tech University. It's a paper we published. I have shown you the paper uh, before, but you can see very well that we have this shear behavior, you can see. Um, but it, the, the point is not the test. The point is here to discuss about the falling mass. And you can see that this falling mass is hitting the specimen. The specimen can be inside the support and we can measure. The problem is that we cannot measure everything in a proper way and we have little detail. So um, in order to overcome these issues, you know, uh, the research community developed the uh, split Hopkinson bar. You can see here the split Hopkinson pressure bar, SHPB. That is a good tool to characterize in the range from 10 to 1000. The idea is quite easy. You can see you have two bars and you have a specimen between the two bars and you are applying an impact on the first bar called incident bar. 
You can see here a uh, very good, uh, more detailed setup. Generally speaking, in the compressive version of the bar, we have uh, four bars. We can have, in many cases, we don't have four bars, but you can see we have here a streaker, okay? The streaker is launched by a gun, is hitting, you can see here, the incident bar. We have generally a laser system or something to measure the velocity of the streaker. Then uh, the incident bar is equipped, you can see, with the first string gauge. The incident bar is uh, in contact with the specimen, which is also in contact with another bar called transmission bar, where we have another string gauge, and then we have a momentum bar and a buffer. So the principle is quite easy. First, we increase the speed of the streaker. The streaker is eating here. This contact is producing the propagation of an elastic wave. The elastic wave is propagating inside the incident bar, and we can measure the incident wave by the, the string gauge here. When uh, you know the, the wave is emitting, is in, uh, going on the interface between the specimen and the bar, you know, since the two, they have an uh, impedance mismatch, so if you want the stiffness and the mass are different of the two objects, we have one part of the wave is reflected and one part of the wave is transmitted. The reflected part of the wave, you know, is read again by the incident bar, and the transmitted bar, the transmitted part is read, uh, we can read it by the, the string gauge here. Finally, the momentum bar and the buffer, you know, they have the function, you know, to uh, reduce the speed, you know, of the um, system and dissipate the energy induced by the gun. This is the split Hopkinson bar, the largest in the world we developed uh, at the Nanjing Tech University. And you can see the key elements I just told you before. This is the gas gun. The gas gun is increasing the speed of the streaker. We have the laser system here to measure the velocity, and you can see the typical elements with the huge buffer system, huge in this case because the scale of this bar has a diameter of 155 millimeter, again, is the bigger, the biggest scale in the world. And uh, we can measure, you know, the sticks. So the principle is quite easy. Again, we have the streaker or impactor here is called con in getting in touch with the incident bar. This is propagating the first wave moving, you can see here, when the wave, you know, is meeting the, is encountering the specimen, you know, we have the reflection and the measurement. Since the string gauge on the incident bar is located at a certain distance, you know, we can measure in a separate way. You can see we don't have any overlap between the transmitted and the reflected wave. And you can see, uh, sorry, the incident and the reflected wave. And you can see here, we can also measure the transmitted wave in this case. Uh, certainly, you know, the equilibrium is reached because several reflections, you know, are uh, performed inside the specimen. You know, we are observing some part of them. And this makes us possible to reach a state of equilibrium of the specimen. Let's write some equations, okay, to understand a little bit better how to use these uh, waves. So what we can do, we can calculate the velocity on the first phase, okay, the phase on the left and the velocity on the second left. The velocity on the first left is equal to CB. CB is the uh, velocity, the speed sound inside the steel, or if you want it, the steel bar material. Uh, is the bar material, generally we are, we are using steel in my research group, but is the velocity, wave velocity inside the, uh, the, the wave. And you can see at some point, you know, we can find this position here and we have uh, the difference okay between the incident and the reflected wave is giving you the deformation at this interface which multiplied you can see by the speed wave you know is giving you the velocity of this phase same you know we can calculate the velocity here by multiplied by the transmitted wave or the one measured on the output bar so you can see here that the average strain rate can be calculated as the velocity one minus the velocity two uh, divided by the length right because the velocity one minus the velocity two is giving you the velocity deformation of the specimen here. And if you substitute this term here, you can find the strain rate. The strain is certainly the integral, the integral with respect to the time of the strain rate. And if we integrate this, we can have the strain. So uh, what we can do is also calculating the forces, because if we know the deformation here, we can easily multiply, okay, by the elastic modulus, the deformation to know the forces. And we can again calculate the force here and the force here and calculate the average stress on the two phases. At this point, if you retake the equations I just uh, tried to explain briefly here, we have a set of equations that are giving us, you know, giving this uh, record, this is a typical record of the SHPB, they are giving us the opportunity to calculate the average stress, the strain, and the strain rate of the specimen during the test. You can see everything is crazy fast. Please look at the scale here, okay? 
Um, and this is a test with a normal camera. You can see that everything is happening in a crazy way. And that's the reason because we have to use state-of-the-art acquisition system and state-of-the-art sensor. Certainly, this should respect important things. I will go very fast because uh, this requires uh, a lot of time to be clearly explained, like one-dimensional planar elastic wave propagation. So this means the bar should be clearly aligned. The inferential friction and inertial friction can be negligible. Uh, we are using some lubricants, you know, in order to reduce this, the correct determination of the three waves and uh, the stress equilibrium between the two ends of the specimen uh, should be uh, equal. And we have to have a constant strain rate deformation. So we can also test under tension. You can see if this is the typical test performed under tension. We can also test under compression and we can reproduce what is well known for static test, a Brazilian test, for instance. And you can see that we can move the specimen in this direction and apply a load similar to the Brazilian tests. And in the literature, there are also additional tests we can do for the, te for the tensile characterization of the material. But in this case, you know, I will skip this part and I will discuss mainly on the Brazilian test. So before to more about the green materials and what we're doing is good also to give you an overview of the uh, typical behavior of the concretes. In this case, you can see the DIF, so the, in terms of strength. And you can see that it's quite common. Okay, this is a study from Bischoff and Perry from uh, not so new, you know, from 1991. It was a review paper, you know. And uh, they show very well that there is uh, all the tests are showing clearly. You can see an increase of the strength, you know, when we are increased the uh, strain rate. And you can see for the case of compressive, we can also reach a uh, two magnifier. This is well known in the literature, and there are several standards and code providing us predictive equation for this. You can see here a general overview. And you can see here also a comparison you know, of this, saying that there is a general mismatch, you can see, of the different uh, uh, models in the literature. But still, I mean, the behavior is well known, and there is a general agreement. And uh, if you have to design for something, my suggestion is to use the sub -thib. Uh, and you can see here a summary directly from the code of the main equation. Uh, as I told you, the proposal in the literature for uh, this type of material is huge. You can see, and uh, there are many, many material, I mean, the, con the traditional concrete. And you can see some of them with a comparison of database we build are working well or some well are not working so well. But in general, we have a bunch of model that designer can be used in case of impact. And similar consideration can be extended to the tensile case you can see here where we have this um, DIF, you can see here, uh, for the tensile. And you can see also in this case, if we compare with the uh, experimental data, some equations are good, some equations are not so good, but in any case, they are working. Okay, uh, as I told you, the green materials can be used in a proper way, and I think this is a good idea. And uh, you can see here that the first example I will show you is the recycle aggregate concrete. So the idea is to... Um, you can see here to crush some concrete and reuse this as an aggregate. Um, we performed this test by using natural coarse aggregate, recycle crushed aggregate and bricks. You can see here the, mi the mix uh, proportion that we used of the test matrix. And you can see that the, um, we test a different substitution level of the coarse aggregate. Generally speaking, as I told you, we are observing, you can see a reduction of the mechanical performance of recycled concrete aggregate and brick aggregate. In the case of brick, it's a little bit higher. And you can see that there is also a change of the typical uh, fracture mechanism due to the fact that we are introducing the aggregates with low adhesive performance with respect to the cement matrix due to the um, not good performing at the interface, the interfacial transition zones between the two the cement paste and their new aggregate. So you can see here that also the dynamic behavior is showing an increase with the pressure. The pressure is a measure, in this case, the pressure of the gun of the strain rate. And you can see that generally speaking, in this case, what we can do is to calculate a equation for the di dynamic increase factor. And uh, what we proposed here, you can see is well known that we are observing, you can see an increase of the DIF when we are introducing uh, the uh, recycle aggregate, so this means that the material is more strain rate sensitive. We propose that you can see here two equations uh, with this form here, AR plus PR multiplied by the logarithmic of the strain rate. So uh, by uh, comparing also with other study, you can see here that we can uh, see very well the, uh, the, that our models is able to reproduce the dynamic increase factor and it can be usually easily used by, by this table here by adopting the coefficients proposed in this table here. 
Another important material we try to investigate is the fiber uh, reinforced. You can see here, um, rubberized uh, uh, concrete. You can see here, this fiber uh, reinforced rubberized concrete, you know, is uh, a concrete where we are substituting the aggregates, you know, with these uh, rubber particles generally coming from tires. And we are trying, you can see also to use uh, um, steel fibers. Um, this is the test matrix. Again, in this case, we substitute different level of the rubber and the uh, uh, steel fiber. We produce two types of specimen for tensile and compression. And you can see this is the aggregates that we used and the typical steel fiber. And you can see very well the, that in case of rubber, the ETA, ITZ, or if you want the interfacial transition zone, is less performing compared to the uh, other case. Um, this is the summary you can see of the compressive strength. And you can see that generally speaking, when we add only the uh, fibers, you can see the strength is almost the same. There is a slight increase. Uh, but you can see the ductility here expressed with uh, in a non-dimensional way, you know, in terms of uh, toughness, you know, is increasing a lot. But when we introduce the rubber, you know, we can decrease the strength and we can uh, supply more toughness or if you want ductility of the system. And we are also observing a, a strong reduction of the elastic modulus. So in this way, we have a material that we can tailor control, we can tailor uh, according to our needs in order to change the, you can see the st the strength the stiffness, and we can also change the ductility. We perform different tests, you can see here, for this material, in particular static compressive tanks, and the split, uh, or if you want, Brazilian static test, and we also observe, you can see here, we perform the split Hopkinson bar, and you can see uh, uh, an example here, this is not the same split Hopkinson bar I've shown you before. So you can see that we define the typical failure modes, you can see here of this material, and uh, you can see also we have, you can see, increasing the rubber content. We have a decrease of the strength and an increase of ductility. With the fiber, you know, we can balance this. We can still have also with the rubber an increase of the strength, but we can have very large ductility. So therefore, we obtain a very good material, you can see, that can be adopted under impact. Um, after this, we again developed an equation, a predictive equation. You can see here the results in terms of SRF and DIF, and you can see that our equation for SRF for the static uh, reduction factor is working very well, but for the dynamic, it's not very accurate, but still it's very simple. So we try to balance the complexity of the equation with the uh, needs. So we also perform tensile tests. You can see here that the idea is similar. In case of rubber, the tensile strength is decreasing a lot, but the fiber is supplying a better understanding. And we performed, again, split Hopkinson bar of this. So you can see here that this makes possible to also characterize the behavior. And again, we found a material working very well when you have the fiber, you can see, under impact. And we can tailor, again, the behavior of this material according to our needs by changing the quantity of rubber and the quantity of steel. And you can see we provide a full characterization of the deformation process, you can see understanding also at local scale what's going on on the crack interface and we have a full control of this material. Also under tension we provide a simple you know predictive equation like this one reported here. Finally what I want to show you is the last research we are doing now. This paper is at the moment under review is the use of plastic aggregates. We try to use two different types of plastic aggregates in particular a PET powder and then a mix uh, uh, plastic. So you can see this mix is to combine together the powder together with this plastic made of PE and PA. And you can see we performed a full test matrix also in this case. You can see the static results where you can see that the PT is increasing with respect, but in general the plastic is increasing with respect to the natural aggregate concrete ductility with a certain reduction you know, of the peak value of the force. And you can see we also performed several SHPB tests where we apply the load in a much faster way. And what we did, and this is something also we are investigating more, we provide a probabilistic equation you can see here for the DIF, is a very simple linear equation. We perform, instead of perform a point analysis, we perform a Bayesian regression of the coefficient theta one and theta two. And we consider that epsilon is the distributed as a normal distribution here. And so therefore we characterize the sigma square. And you can see here that we characterize the behavior of this material in this case uh, with a mean standard deviation and uh, also a sigma of the behavior. Also, in this case, we characterize the full behavior at a local scale. So we have a full understanding of the crack development, you can see here. And uh, we were able to understand the behavior of 
this material. So um, concluding this uh, presentation, what we are doing now is to try to understand, okay, the general behavior of this material. Uh, at the moment, we are working on two different uh, uh, directions. One is the use of foamed concrete with plastic aggregates. It's a research uh, performed now by a PhD. And uh, uh, we are also working on different types of plastic aggregates to understand and shapes if we can understand, if we can optimize the material. So the definition of the constitutive law of concretes under high strain rate requires complex experimental techniques. So and uh, today I tried my best in this uh, short um, keynote speech to give you an overview of the te experimental techniques. Uh, I hope that this can trigger, you know, more collaboration. I mean, uh, with uh, with you. Um, and the green-based material can offer a good performance under high strain rate, reducing the environmental impact. And the reason for that is that, yeah, the, that's true. The mechanical performance are less, but in many cases, the ductility is more. And so this means that for dissipating energy, they can be good. Our approach, as you can understand, is generally to provide uh, experimental testing and try to provide some predictive, simple equation that can be used by a practitioner for whatever purpose. And uh, yeah, more research is needed to develop standard approach for their implementation in the practice. And my feeling is that this green material under impact can be really, really um, a good idea for the future research. And uh, uh, I think it's a good idea. Here, you can also find some of the main publications on the topic uh, of recycled material and uh, impact at material scale. Uh, we have also a lot of papers on the structural level, but I mean, if you're interested, please let me know and uh, I will share with you, send me an email. And uh, it's important to acknowledge all my students working hard uh, in impact and uh, general. So you can read here a uh, general um, name, starting from Professor Xiao Yen, who is the first one introducing me to this topic. Uh, Dr. Xu Jin Jun now at uh, Nanjing Tech University and the name of the many of the students here reported working on this area. With this, I think that I respected the time. I try my best to keep my 45 minutes presentation. I will say xie xie in Chinese, thank you for your attention. And since we are moving, I think, to the um, not recorded part of the presentation, I am very happy to reply you um, um, for uh, whatever question you would like to ask me. Thanks for your time and see you there in uh, uh, in uh, um, online mode. Thanks.